You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wine, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O. Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Tim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. So welcome to the show today, Tom Abram. He has a phenomenal new series. Uh, it's called The Watchers. Uh, book one was The Bar at the End of the World, uh, which I discovered on audiobook several months ago and have been excited about it ever since. The newest book in that series is The Bar at the Edge of the Sea, and then book three to finish out that trilogy will be The Bar in the Middle of Nowhere, coming soon uh, to an, an Audible app and, and uh, a bookstore near you. Uh, welcome to the show, Tom. Uh, Hank, thanks so much for having me. It's, it's a, a real honor to be on your show, and I'm looking forward to talking about books with you. Excellent. Tom, uh, you know, like I mentioned, I'm a huge fan uh, of the book, The Bar at the, uh, at the End of the World, and uh, have been looking forward to talking with you. Uh, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? So I was a reader long before I was a writer, and when I was a young kid, uh, I started reading somewhat early and devoured book after book, and I had a really good childhood, but I found books as a way to escape and to fantasize, and I always thought that if I ever had the ability to do the same for other people, I would want to do it, and so I found myself uh, at a very young age, in addition to just binge reading Encyclopedia Brown books and Hardy Boys novels and Westerns that I uh, would would type type away on an old Smith Corona Selectric and uh, come up with these little short stories, none of which were very good, but that's that's where it all started. That's amazing. You just described my reading childhood as well. Encyclopedia Brown, Hardy Boys. Um, I, I had a friend whose dad had a ton of Louis L'Amour westerns um, that that he let me dig through all the time. Uh, man, what I, I wish I could go back and read all of that stuff for the first time again. That would be so amazing. It was fantastic to to put yourself in in the shoes of those brothers or of uh, of Encyclopedia Brown, you know, and I had always try to figure it out before I'd flip to the back to figure out whether I was right as to why he <laughs> solved the mystery. Um, I also like choose your own adventure books, I think, because it gave it gave me the sense that I was controlling the story somewhat. I think a lot of young readers liked those books for the same reason. So, uh, Tom, did anyone around you, any any adult, uh, a parent, uh, a teacher, maybe someone, did they recognize this the storytelling gene uh, that you uh, you know were born with the, this thing that makes a kid run to the typewriter and and type out a story and uh, you know did you share those with family members or anyone uh, who was the first one to kind of recognize that that you had this this gift. Well, I think you're being generous to say I have a gift, but thank you. Um, I'll, I'll say, you know, my I think the first time I realized that maybe I had some talent at it uh, and the connection between reading so much and writing was my freshman year of high school. I had an English teacher who gave me my first English paper back and at the top of it wrote, you must be a big reader. And I kind of made the connection at that point that reading and writing – went hand in hand that to be a good writer, you needed to be a reader. And I started writing for my high school paper at that point. Um, and from, from there on, uh, you know, got into the world of journalism in large part because of writing, it's a different kind of writing, but I tell stories every day that way. And so I think that was really the first time that I, that I saw that as something that maybe that was my thing. Um, I'd always enjoyed writing and, you know, poetry or short stories or creative writing assignments. Always, 
always enjoy doing those even in elementary school. But the first time I think I really got the kind of reinforcement that gave me an idea I, I could maybe do it was uh, as, a, as a freshman in English. That's uh, that's amazing. Um, Tom, you have an interesting day job uh, and, and you kind of alluded to it there that allows you to uh, to write and to storytell in, in a different medium. Uh, what is your day job and what drew you to it originally? Sure. So I'm a, a television news reporter and anchor. I specialize in in politics uh, and uh, other substantive issues. Of course, I'll do the car wrecks or daily news when it's called for. In the last six months, every story almost has been COVID related. Um, I got into it. Uh, I was in my study hall in freshman year and and somebody on the newspaper walked by and asked if anybody wanted to write a, uh, an article about uh, for the feature page about the history of names. And I volunteered and wrote it. And then they asked me to uh, be a regular contributor and then to try out to be an editor. And then when I went to college, I knew that I wanted to be a journalist and went to University of Florida because of their opportunities in television and radio and the well-rounded education I could get and uh, got very lucky and, and got a job uh, before I graduated as a full-time TV news reporter. And that's what I've been doing now for the last, well, it was January of 1993. So it's it's been a while. And the last 20 years of which have been here in Houston. Tom, there there has to be a bit of irony um, in the fact that you are a, a television news reporter as your quote unquote day job. We, we know that that doesn't exactly follow typical workday hours. Um, so we, we kind of, you know, laughingly say day job. Um, and your your writing preference seems to be kind of post apocalyptic. Um, th- that's kind of funny um, that that there's that that intersection uh in your your work and your uh your other work that you do um what do you think about that and and what originally led you to uh post-apocalypse sure so i started writing um political thrillers because that's kind of the world that i know and i wrote a a couple based in dc and then i wrote a, a series that Athon is is going to publish uh, late this year or next uh, about um, some Texas politics. But um, I, I really uh, kind of got into the post-apocalyptic genre through a friend and, and fellow author, Steve Conkley, who uh, wrote a really great selling series called Perseid Collapse. And uh, he asked me uh, to write essentially fan fiction when he had uh, a licensed Kindle world through Amazon. And I wrote a trilogy of short stories and they did really well. And so he said, you know, you really should write your own series. And so I started with uh, the book home and it did far better than I expected. And so that that's where I kind of put the political and action adventure stuff aside and started writing primarily dystopian and post-apocalyptic books. There's, there's a real audience for it and they're very loyal uh, and they're engaged. And I, I love that about the genre. Noveler is the best way to write a novel. Why? Quite simply because we've made it the easiest place to do it. Writing a novel is hard enough. Noveler takes care of all the logistical bits of writing a novel, just leaving that small matter of the words to you. It's a clean, beautiful writing interface with writing analytics, goals and streaks, advanced grammar checking, version control, day, evening, and night modes, and many other features designed to take all the stress out of writing. Tell us what you need and we'll build it. Together, we'll build a better tool. With a design-led approach, all the right tools that you need Noveler saves all your words constantly, allows you to manage and order your novel easily. It's accessible from any device, desktop or mobile. It syncs to Google Drive and Dropbox. It allows exports in various formats, including ebook and more. It also has nice touches like allowing you to write 
both offline and online, unique for a web-based platform. Everyone needs help with their writing from inspiration through to grammar checking, so we're doing our best to provide that support. We integrate that support directly into Noveler. Our advanced grammar checker powered by Pro Writing Aid does everything from spell check to style advice. Our writing courses include the incredible Tim Clare's Couch to ADK. We're really excited to offer all Author Stories listeners 30% off Noveler for a whole year. And it doesn't matter if you choose to sign up for the monthly or annual plan. You'll get 30% off. All you need to do is use the discount code HANK when you sign up. Noveler, N-O-V-L-R. That's noveler.org. What is it about the genre that that hooks people? Um, can you tell, like, what is it about this genre that makes such uh, ardent fans? Well, you know, it's funny. I, I I said to my editor once, and this is actually, I think, in the foreword of one of my series. I said to my editor, you know, people really love reading about the end of the world. And she said, no, they love reading about surviving the end of the world. And so I think people in, in the back of our minds, you know, everybody has this fear of what the end would look like. It's why zombie movies are so popular. It's why, uh, you know, disaster movies are so popular. Everybody imagines what would I do in that situation? How would I survive? What would happen to my family? And because it's such a universal theme, I, I think it appeals to a pretty broad base of people. And then, then you have an entire community of uh, preparedness enthusiasts who who like putting themselves and and checking their own preparations against what authors write fictionally, and so I think that's that's why they devour it and uh, keep coming back and enjoy you know a variety of scenarios in which the world as we know it changes. The, uh, the, there is something to that, uh, you know, wanting to watch someone survive the end of the world. It's it's the the thing about the human spirit can overcome anything, even when you throw the worst possible scenarios at it. No no one wants to read a, po- a post apocalyptic story, and then you know everyone that they care about for 400 pages. Then dies at the end, and then credits. You know, there's there, exactly. there, there has to there has to be that that sense of hope there in you know amidst uh, you know the the worst possible situation. Oh, I agree, and I and I think you know as I as I write these different series, um, it's 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 also more than just about surviving. It's also about humanity and uh, people. Sometimes go to go to the worst. Sometimes people rise to the best, and I try to explore that um, in in differing ways uh, through the different series that I've written. This idea of of good and evil and survival and and uh, people's you know most basic instinct and and what lines they're willing to cross to keep themselves alive and and what lines they won't cross. Your your day job uh, as a reporter. You get to see the very best and the very worst of human behavior and the human condition. Um, you know, looking back through the books that you've written, um, th- there are a lot of really intriguing subjects that you have delved into. Um, I go back to uh, the the two book series that you did with sedition and intention. Um, you talked about writing political thrillers. Um, what is it about writing these kinds of stories that really grabbed your imagination? And, uh, you know, knowing the facts, uh, as you've learned through the years, how does that inform the writing that you do? Sure. So, you know, I mean, I think the best thing to do oftentimes is to write what you know. Um, sometimes I do it better than others. Uh, and people tell me if what I'm writing, I appear not to know much about, <laughs> but, you know, I, 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 I certainly, you know, I've spent, um, a career building, um, sources and a reputation in covering politics. And so to write about it, I think was from a fictional perspective was fun. Um, you'll find in a lot of my series, whether they are political or action adventure or dystopian, I always have this backdrop of a conspiracy somewhere in there. Um, I'm not a, a conspiracy theorist by nature. 
Um, but I do enjoy reading about conspiracies and what people think. And so including them in is, is kind of fun to, to broaden the story and to that people, people oftentimes say one thing and do another. I found that to be the case uh, frequently in, in covering politics uh, or just people in general. And so to, to add those elements to my stories, I think uh, adds another layer to them. Uh, a lot of people seem to like that conspiracy element. Some don't, but that's okay. Um, you know, I, I just think that um, I've seen so much in my day job and told so many stories about things not appearing to be what we thought they were at first that, that I like to bring that element into the fiction that I write. Well, you, you have you bring up a great point about, uh, you know, conspiracy theories. I don't really consider myself um, a conspiracy theorist um, per se, uh, but I, I always love a great conspiracy tale. Like there's something about kind of taking what we do, just part of our human nature of wanting to cover things up or manipulate facts or, or whatever it is, and then kind of expand on that to the nth degree. And, you know, we get a great conspiracy theory tale um, out of that, that it, it, uh, it, it in a weird way, it kind of helps you process the world around you to kind of think in terms like that. I think so. I think, I think um, sometimes, you know, the true answer is the most basic, uh, but, and it's also the hardest to accept. And so we create these, these theories that help us maybe wrap our mind around why something is happening or happened when in reality, the truth is it's as simple as it appears on its face, but as human, it's human nature, I think, to want deeper explanations about things. Um, in the bar at the end of the world, there's not really any conspiracy. But there is a lot of mystery about what's going on and 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 the themes of good and evil and the balance of the world uh, and and humanity, I think, are, are strong themes that in some way echo conspiracy. Right. Because we don't really know um, what lies beyond. But there are a lot of theories about it. Uh, people have a lot of faith. And so I kind of delve into those areas, which to me was similar to writing about conspiracy and that there are things that. That, that nobody can necessarily prove, but that that certainly fascinate uh, large segments of of the population and, and people who like to read fiction. Tom, you've also uh, delved into science fiction, and I'm looking at your your Spaceman duology um, that you published. Uh, what is it about science fiction and and this sort of science fiction, the kind of off world? Uh, science fiction that uh, that grabs your imagination. Sure. So so I live in Houston. Before Houston, I lived in Orlando. I cover the space program a lot, and so sure. I, I I thought of an I- idea that you know, well, what would what would an astro- I mean, what would an astronaut do if he were on the International Space Station and all the power went out? And that was the impetus for that series of books. And so uh, I've always been fascinated by space. I've covered. Uh, oh, NASA for the better part of 25 years uh, as, as part of my job and really enjoy the idea of, of space. And so with the help of people from NASA and, and retired folks from NASA, I, I kind of started writing this story that tells, tells what an apocalypse would be like, not only from the perspective of this astronaut who's on the International Space Station and his effort to get back to Earth, but then what's happening with his family on Earth as they struggle with this new reality of there not being any, any power. And so, you know, I, I haven't necessarily written anything with aliens yet. Uh, but I, but I love space opera as well. Yeah. So it, it's, it, you know, I, I think I, I'm always trying to challenge myself. I'm always trying to make the next series I write a little bit different than what I did before. And so I, I can see myself, writing uh, you know space opera that that it also explores this the dystopian or post-apocalyptic theme 
You know, in, in the last month or so, we've had um, this really exciting SpaceX launch, and the astronauts are currently at the International Space Station, and then, you know, we'll get to watch their uh, them leaving the space station and re-entering Earth's atmosphere, and uh, you know, praying uh, come in safely. Um, what's the what's the temperature around Houston uh, concerning that? You know, this is a really monumental time where we've got uh, you know NASA working with the private sector and and doing some really cool stuff right now. What's it like around Houston is where that's concerned? Well, I think there's a lot of excitement, uh, not just at NASA, but also in in all of the, the, the private industry that, that surrounds NASA and all the contractors. I think, you know, there's this there's this new uh, life that's been breathed into what they're doing. And they're not just working with SpaceX, you know, there's Boeing and, and other companies that are that are working to get uh, into space with the help of NASA. And at, at the end of uh, the Apollo missions, and there was this brain drain where all the really good people went into the private sector and, and NASA lost a lot of its really brilliant people. And so when the space shuttle program ended, uh, there was that concern here in Houston with the end of, of manned space flight uh, leaving from the US, there was a concern that maybe that would happen again. But I think this public private sector partnership uh, really has invigorated um, that sector. And I think there's a lot of hope for the future uh, for manned spaceflight and exploration to moon and to the moon and uh, to Mars and beyond. Yeah, absolutely. Um, looking at the kinds of books that you've written and you have a huge back catalog, uh, Tom, how long have you been writing and publishing? So my uh, complicated answer, I'll simplify it. Wrote my first <laughs> book uh, in my in my late twenties, uh, uh, like 1999, 2000, that area. Uh, it was really horrible, um, but I got a lot of really good feedback uh, about what I did right and what I did wrong. I then start started and stopped maybe another half dozen novels of varying genres. And I just uh, I kept at it uh, until I found something that really clicked, and that was Sedition, which um, I wrote in 2008 and nine, and then tried to get it traditionally published. I had you know some interest from agents, but nothing really clicked, and so I shelved it. And in 2012, I reached out to some author friends who suggested that you know uh, self-publishing uh, was exploding and that I should try it, that it wasn't quite what vanity publishing had been in the past. And so published uh, Sedition in, in 2012. And with the help of an editor, it ended up, I ended up selling it to a small publisher, uh, uh, Post Hill Press, along with uh, four other books. And I did okay. But, you know, I, I felt like maybe I would be better off on my own. So I so I bought back, ultimately bought back all of those books uh, and started self-publishing again in December of 2015. And all so the rest of my catalog, I'm, I'm writing. I should finish book number 28 today. And so most of the most of that has been within the last five years. Scribophile is a respectful online writing workshop and writer's community. Writers of all skill levels join to improve each other's work with thoughtful critiques and by sharing their writing experiences. We're the writing group to join if you want to find beta readers, get the best feedback around, learn how to get published, and be a part of the friendliest and most successful writing workshop online. Improve your writing by receiving detailed critiques. Learn from a vast collection of free writing resources. Make lifelong friends in our busy community of writers. Writing is a solitary art, but that doesn't mean you have to be lonely. Lucky for you, there are thousands of writers on Scribophile every day, and we're a really friendly bunch. You've never seen a writing group like this one. Join Scribophile today at Scribophile.community. Wow, that is amazing. The... You know the um, the Kindle revolution really pushed the the, uh, the advent of, of self publishing becoming what it has uh, become over you know the the la in within the last decade. Um, you know as uh, as someone who uh, who 
gets to look at things a little differently because of your day job. Um, how do you feel like uh, it seems to me that self-publishing has really matured and become um, not only a viable uh, opportunity for a lot of people to publish, but really a, a serious competitor to uh, the traditional publishing landscape. Um, how do you feel about the state of publishing right now and where we find ourselves? Well, I think it's tough. Um, you know, it's it's not the same as it was. 2012 or in 2015, right. um, you know, it's for a variety of reasons that I'm sure you've discussed before. It's, it's really difficult to, um, to stand out and which, which is what traditional publishing had always been. And so, you know, I think, I think now um, maybe a lot of the, the chaff is beginning to sink and the, the wheat <laughs> is rising again. So, I mean, I think the quality of what's out there is, is maybe better than it's ever been uh, from independent authors. I think traditional publishing recognizes that and, and tries to compete both on a pricing level and on the, the types of genres that they offer. Um, but, you know, if I didn't already have a, have somewhat of a, of a platform uh, that, that's five years old, uh, I, I don't know where I'd begin right now. It's there's, so, there's, there's so much, being published and there's so many talented people putting things out there that it's 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 a really competitive place to be both ebook and per, uh, print and audio even audio now is 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 a challenge to to get a foothold and to find that audience that that wants to come back for more the next time well, and part of that, Tom, comes down to kind of finding where you fit and the the kinds of stories that you tell. You know, are you telling the kinds of things that there's an audience there um, that that wants those things? And, you know, part of um, being a self-published author is you have to put that other hat on sometimes and, and deal with the business of publishing, um, you know, which is an entirely different conversation. But with the you know, with your uh, kind of turn to um, post-apocalypse, uh, it, it seems like you have really connected with an audience there. I, I hope so. I mean, I do have, I think, a, a nice base of loyal readers um, who will go with me on any adventure that I want to take. Uh, and then there are those who really just want the straight up post-apocalyptic survival type story. And, and aren't necessarily as interested in some of the more um, tangential things that I'll do uh, with a series. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, some, some of my series sell really well and some of them not as well because they're just not the audience for it. But I, but I wrote it because it was something I wanted to explore. And I hope that there's an audience for it. You know, um, yeah. that's, that's a real trick. I think you talked about the business side of it. You know, there is a trick between writing what you like and what you know and 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 what the audience really wants. And I know some authors are outstanding at really finding out and targeting where the audience is at any given time. I don't spend as much time doing that. I just I have so much limited time as it is uh, with my day job that that I spend my time writing and then doing the business stuff that I need to do to keep it running. And I I write what I think people are going to like. Sometimes I'm right. Sometimes I'm wrong. Well, uh, speaking of that, Tom, you mentioned earlier, uh, you know, kind of playing the the what if game uh, that a lot of writers will do in the beginning of a of a new project. And, you know, coming up with sort of a concept and then thinking, what would happen if this happened? And, you know, how would a character respond to this or, you know, like that? Is that how the writing process begins for you usually? Is it? Is it the the what if questions that then start a story to to take shape, or what's that first kernel of a story idea that comes to you? That's a really good question, and I think a lot of times it just is kind of a one or two sentence idea that I'll have during my commute, and I think you know that could be a really good story, and then it morphs into something different or greater, but that kernel of it is still there, um, you know. Uh, with with home uh, and the traveler series the idea that i originally had is something that kind of just appears in in book two uh it's really just kind of one scene in book two it's where i envisioned the, the series beginning 
uh, but I ended up not writing it that way. And, and I just kind of said, you know, what, what if I just kind of made a, a post-apocalyptic story set in Texas that it feels as much like a Western as it does like a dystopian novel. And that's, that's kind of where that came. And it's very stylized and, um, you know, to fit that Western genre. Um, and so that's how that came, you know, in the spaceman, when I, I mentioned that in the, the bar at the end of the world, I just had this idea um, of, I, I don't want to give too much away, but, but an idea of a guy who wasn't really good, who almost an anti-hero, uh, who finds himself wanting redemption and for, for the things that he's done. And that's, that's the kernel that kind of set the bar at the end of the world in, into being. How fun is it uh, to to turn some of those uh, tropes on their head? You know, we we think of a a protagonist as someone that you automatically want to root for and someone you want to get behind. Uh, you know, their troubles or your troubles, uh, that sort of thing. Um, but bringing an anti-hero, you know, is is a gamble in a, in a lot of cases. Uh, but done well, those can kind of become some of the best protagonists. Um, as you started thinking through the anti-hero, uh, what were some of the challenges that that you had to overcome? Well, it's funny, you know. I find often the hardest character for me to write is the protagonist. Um, I find the ancillary hero, you know, the ancillary characters, the sidekicks, and the villains to be easier for me to write and to kind of build into people the, the hero is hardest for me and so in this case you know i wanted him to be a very likable guy with a lot of redeeming char- characteristics but that the, the actions that he'd taken in his life were despicable you know yeah. that he's working he's working for essentially the mob and he's stealing and he's uh you know going against the rules at every turn and then he in, in the very beginning, you learn he's abandoned uh, the love of his life. He's left her to fend for herself when he gets into a tight spot. And that, those are all despicable things. But I wanted him, I wanted to, to kind of find a way to make him still likable as he seeks to be liked uh, yeah. by, higher, by higher powers. I think that was a real challenge. Um, like I said, I think that it's always the secondary characters, for whatever reason, are easier for me to write. Well, and it's it's also kind of easy to assume a, a character's motivation when when this character has uh, a 40 hour a week job and a home and a family. And, you know, that we can take a character like that and, and play all sorts of other games with what they might do when posed with a certain situation. But when you've stripped all of that stuff away from a character and their motivations become very different than than what you or I might do. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's interesting that you say that because sometimes readers, I think, mistake what a character says or does for the way the author feels or is. And yeah. you know, I'm, 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 there may be a little element of me and all the characters that I write, whether it's my sense of humor or my core beliefs or the way I think I might react to something. But but none of the characters are me, and most of what they say has nothing to do with how I see the world. I'm not, I'm not a guy who's a water bootlegger who lives in some post-apocalyptic landscape and, you know, in my early 20s and leaves my girlfriend to fend for herself. I, that's not me. So getting in that headspace isn't necessarily the easiest thing to do. And yet, and yet readers oftentimes, I think, transpose what the author is saying in the book to be, you know, how I see the world. And it's, it's really not, it's an exploration of how I think other people may see the world. Well, I think that's uh, a rookie mistake that a lot of authors, uh, new authors will make is confusing their character with their core beliefs and, you know, not being able to, to overcome that hurdle to to explore how someone I someone else might feel, um, you know, once you can get past that and then portray the character for who they are, not as a reflection of who you are, um, that's where some real growth can come uh, for a writer. 
Yeah, I, I think so. Um, just as a, you know, as a political journalist, um, the idea is for nobody to know what my political beliefs are. And yeah. so if I've, if I've done a story that's upset people across the spectrum, then I've done my job because they have no idea where I stand. And I think that's, I, I carry that, I think, a little bit into the writing that I do. You know, I've, I've written one book uh, where people said I was, you know, that Hillary Clinton might as well have written the book, that it was so far <laughs> left. But then, but then someone else, but then, you know, someone else got mad at me because a character had a, had a Make America Great Again t-shirt on and thought that my entire book was Trump propaganda. So, you know, uh, if, if you read across the, the breadth of what I write, you're not going to know where I stand on things, what my political or religious or, or core beliefs are, because in every book, it's different. You know, the characters come from a different place. Um, and so, so to that degree, I guess maybe I'm getting better as a writer because people have no idea where I stand. Well, and the one thing you can never account for is the the bias that the reader brings with them to the book. And and that's just that's just human nature. There's nothing you can do about that. Exactly. People will see in a story what they want to see. And sometimes people will see things in a character that make the character so much richer than what I'd even intended. And that's a wonderful thing. J just as wonderful as if someone thinks that the character is awful, uh, you know, that clearly I, I, I evoke some emotion from them, whether it's good <laughs> or bad. And, and that's all you can ask for. I think as a writer is that you, that, that you, that you somehow connect with someone in a way that, that they had this visceral reaction to what you've written. Exactly. Um, Tom, you are a very prolific writer as, as we've talked about, uh, you've put out a number of series and, you know, still, um, just working your tail off, uh, as a writer, what, what is your writing process like? Are you, are you in the, the pantser camp or are you in the plotter camp? Uh, what's your, your, your pre-writing preparation look like? So I'm a little bit in the middle. Um, I kind of have, uh, you know, like if you're looking at the alphabet, I know A and Z and maybe M and T, um, and the rest of it, I fill in as I go. Um, I'll, I, I write with notes where I don't necessarily have a storyboard, but um, once I've written probably about the first 10,000 words, um, I begin to fill out chapter ideas. So I kind of begin, I build the very beginning of the story and I, I know where it's going to end, or at least I think I know where it's going to end. And I know some high plot points in the middle. But then I begin to fill it in after I've kind of gotten the beginning established and I know who some of the secondary characters are. I then begin to build the chapters with, you know, one or two sentence, no more than a paragraph note about where the book is going to go in that chapter. And then those things get flipped or shortened or changed as I'm going. So I have a, a as I write, it becomes clearer and clearer. Um, I, I don't hold myself to a real strict uh you know, storyboard. I know some authors, it, it works for them and some authors just have to write as they go. But, you know, uh, I'm, I'm somewhere in the middle and sometimes, you know, the character dictates where the story goes and I didn't necessarily expect it. Um, this morning I went back, I'm trying to finish book three, the, uh, the bar in the middle of nowhere from the Watchers series. And I, I'm planning on finishing today. I probably have about another 7,000 words to write. And I've already written a couple thousand, but they didn't get me any farther in the story because I'm writing a scene where a character is reacting to something. And I'm thinking, you know, what's the motivation for the way he's reacting here? I, I'm missing something about 10 pages back. And so I went back and I added to it. And it wasn't something that I anticipated or had plotted. But then as I'm getting closer to the end of the book, I'm like, he need, this, this needs to happen back earlier in the book. So I'm, I'm doing that constantly throughout the process. It's somewhere between having no clue what I'm doing and, and somewhat <laughs> knowing what I'm doing. You know, some of these arguments between planners and 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 pantsers uh, really kind of make me laugh because I think the the vast majority of writers are, uh, you know, have some form of, of what you do. There There's a they, you know, they're hybrids. Uh, I, I know some people that are that are firmly in each camp, but but they're the minority. Um, most people you know, have a little of this and a little of that. And, uh, you know, the fun is in those gray areas. Yeah. That's where I think the story really begins to take shape is when it goes to a place you didn't necessarily expect. And I've had some of the, maybe the, you know, the best 
twists in a book happen when I'm just writing something that I didn't think I was going to include. And then I'm like, oh, this fits perfectly. And there's a twist. Um, and, and it makes the book that much better. Um, I, at least I like to think that it makes the book that much better. And there are, there are a couple of twists in, in at Bar at the End of the World, um, one of which, you know, I toyed with revealing at the very beginning of the book and then decided, no, this, this would be good, you know, three quarters of the way through because it would really affect the main character's arc. Uh, and, and then towards the end, there's another twist where the character, the main character who after the first twist is revealed, begins to believe that all of this is about one particular thing. And he learns in the final pages that it really wasn't about that at all. Um, and those, those were things that evolved as I was writing the story as to where I would put those into the story. Tom, we've talked about the changes in the publishing industry over the years and how self-publishing has really come into its own. The The latest trend that we uh, notice is um, the uh, the explosion of audiobooks. Uh, and audiobooks are nothing new. We've had books on tape, you know, as far back as I can remember. But something has happened in the last year or two that has just skyrocketed um, audiobooks. And it's, you know, people are talking about it as the next, you know, growth market and all of that. Um, it, as as someone who discovered your work through audiobooks, um, you know the the bar at the end of the world uh, I discovered on Audible uh, through our mutual friend uh, Steve Bowyer. Uh, how do you feel like that audio is changing um, publishing, and does that affect the way that you write? Knowing that you know that's going to be one of the biggest areas that people might discover you on. Sure. So I, I love audiobooks. In fact, most of my reading now is through audio. Um, Me too. I say read, you know, um, I have a long commute each day and uh, I listen to books constantly. I just don't have time to sit and read because I'm either at work or I'm writing. So I, I can't read traditionally as I used to like to. So I've relied on audiobooks. And I, the thing I think I especially love about them is that, uh, you know, the narrator brings a whole nother layer to the story and in, in interpretation that I just find fascinating. Um, and in, in Bar at the End of the World, Bar at the Edge of the Sea, Jonathan Davis, the Hall of Fame narrator, did just a fantastic job of, of creating the, these characters, bringing them to life. Um, it does affect the way I write a little bit. As I think more and more about a book being an audio book, uh, I use fewer and fewer dialogue tags. Um, I try to have more dialogue than, than I used to have because I know that that's what engages me as a listener and as a reader. Right. And so I, I try to emulate that. So it does affect the way I tell a story a little bit. And I, I hope that with each book uh, where I focus on that as the, as the primary thing, that it gets a little better. I don't think writing for an audio book takes away from a, uh, someone who's reading on Kindle or, or in a, in a, paperback or hardcover, I think it actually even enhances the story that much more. Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't know if that answered your question, but um, yeah. I, I, I love audiobooks and I love what they, the additional avenue that, that it gives me to reach readers. You know, Tom, I think the perfect combination is, uh, you know, a physical book, a, a paperback or hardback that I can put on my shelf um, and the audio book in my, in my uh, Audible app that I can listen to the book and and enjoy it that way. But I also love to have the physical copy that I can flip through and, you know, go to a certain scene if I want to, or, um, you know, sometimes it's just love to see, you know, when, when a, a scene of dialogue is really done well, it looks different on the page. You can tell the, the back and forth and, you know, I kind of nerd out on, on stuff like that. I know I'm weird. Um, but you know, the, the combination of those two is kind of the perfect world. Yeah, and it's it's a it's a it's a difficult balance, I think, you know, to to make sure that you're telling a story in a way that that a reader can can put that own voice in their head, uh, and they don't lose anything by by doing that. But but maybe the audio uh, also enhances it for them if if that's the the route that they they choose to go. Um, I you know I I love I love the fact that that readers uh, find me uh, in all those places. And I will say, and, and you've probably found this to be the case too, is that 
you know, your audience for audiobooks is very different from your audio, your audience for Kindle that, that very, yeah. there's not a lot of crossover. You, you may have a huge fan base in audio and not so much in Kindle or a huge fan base in Kindle, not so much in audio. And, and if you're big in both, you know, they are different audiences. Yeah. Yes. Yes, definitely. Well, and, and, you know, God love them. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just excited that people are, uh, you know, still excited about books and new stories. And, um, you know, uh, even though we've been living through a pandemic, this is this has been some of the best time for for books and uh, hopefully uh, for people's creativity as well. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I don't have any delusions about my my ability or the stories I tell. I mean, I'm kind of like right there at, at pulp or a notch above pulp. I'm not writing the next great American novel. I mean, my goal is is to write something I enjoy that I think people are going to like and that entertains them and that helps them escape from whatever the reality is that they want a, a, a break from, uh, even if it's a good reality. Uh, and, and so, you know, to, to reach people on any level, even if it's, if it's just, you know, cartoonish action adventure, it's, it's, it's thrilling to hear from readers that I entertained them for any period of, of time. Absolutely. Um, the the newest series, The Watchers, uh, book one, The Bar at the End of the World, is out everywhere. Book two, The Bar at the Edge of the Sea, also available. And uh, as you've talked about, you're finishing up book three. Do, do we have a tentative uh, published date for that? It'll be in the fall, end of September, uh, late September into October. Um, you know, they'll, we're, we're trying to hit a simultaneous release date, you know, Audible Studios. Uh, you know, I think would love that. And so we want to make sure we hit the, the right date. But the ebook is up for pre order, and, and the audio book will be narrated by Jonathan Davis again. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm excited to partner with him. He just does such a fantastic job, I think, uh, creating, a, creating a world, adding a dimension that, that I can't do just with my word. Well, Tom, uh, I've become a big fan. I can't wait to see how you land this series um i know it's going to be exciting um we're going to put links uh to uh to books one and two and to and for the pre-order uh in the show notes of this episode if people are just discovering you is there a place online where they can connect with you and dig into all the great stuff that you do sure thanks um i mean they can find my profile at athon books a-e-t-h-o-n books uh, dot com uh, or they can go to my website at tom abrams books dot com it's t-o-m a-b-r-a-h-a-m-s books dot com excellent we'll put links to all that in the show notes to make it easy for folks to find you uh tom thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to come on the show it's been a pleasure i really appreciate you taking the time to listen to me blabber world anvil is a browser-based world building platform designed for all world builders, writers and novelists, dungeon masters, game developers, and everyone else. World Anvil keeps your world settings safe and organized, helps you find your characters, locations, plots, timelines, and maps quickly and easily as you write. Then, if you choose, you can showcase your amazing world building to the world, beautifully and interactively, to keep your readers engaged. You can even use our professional tier to build your career selling access to behind the scenes content your readers will love and growing your community. Build your world setting in any genre with over 25 custom built world building templates complete with prompts to inspire your creativity. Allow your readers to explore the public parts of your world in an innovative new way with interactive maps, timelines, and wiki style articles. Give special access to co-authors, beta readers, customers, or patrons to see exclusive behind-the-scenes content. There's a free version to get started with, with all of the major features. Guild membership offers you a host of extra options, including comprehensive privacy settings, co-authors, presentation options, and so much more. Join our community of over 250,000 world builders, including professional authors, Take part in competitions and learn more about world building at this fantastic online community. Use the coupon code HANK to get 20% off all 6 and 12 month subscriptions. WorldAnvil.com 
I'm a recent convert and I know you will be too. 